Small business war stories. Small businesses are the soul of America. And this is where they tell their stories. I am your host, Pablo Fuentes. Hey, lovers of small businesses and good stories in general. Welcome to episode 121 of Small Business War Stories. And today I had a really, really cool interview with a guy named Patch Rubin, who is a guitar maker. He makes guitars in uh, Taos, New Mexico. And he has some really, really amazing things happen to him recently where some major, major artists started playing his guitars and it's had a positive impact on his business. But there's like basically... Why is it that getting part of his finger chopped off was a turning point for the better in Patch's life and Patch's career? And how is it that Tom York of um, of Radiohead and Bill Joe Armstrong of Green Day and also the great, big, amazing mystery artist that we all, I will not name in the introduction, but you will find out in the episode that recently started playing Patch's guitar. How is it that all these big, big artists are... Um, why is it that they love this guitar? And what is it about the way that Patch is creating his instruments that is connecting with uh, so many artists? This is a great episode. I was really excited. We talked about how we overcome um, setbacks. And he had a great philosophy on how to bounce back from setbacks. He's had quite a few of those. And he'll talk about them as both a touring band member as well as a craftsman. And as a uh, as a human being, so he he we had a very good uh, candid conversation. I'm really excited for you to check out this episode. Go check us out at smallbusinesswarstories.com. And without further ado, let's get into today's episode number 121 of Small Business War Stories with Patch Rubin of Wide Sky Guitars. And we are live today, and I am sitting in Austin, but I'm speaking remotely with my friend Patch Rubin, who is in Taos, New Mexico, and Patch is the founder and principal of Wide Sky Guitars. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's uh, it's amazing to have you. Uh, you and I have been connected. We, you and I connected through some mutual friends, so past uh, guests of the show. Uh, you're, you're friends with uh, Matt Ike at uh, Resonator, a mule Resonator, right? Yeah. Yeah, he just sent me text this morning of a new uh, black resonator he's got. Oh yeah, is that is that what he's doing with this? Because he keeps every hundredth guitar, right? So he's like, is that yeah. what he's doing with uh, the number six hundred or whatever that he's made? I suspect so. That's <laughs> it awesome. Looks, it look it looks killer. That's awesome. I'm the proud owner of Mule three thirteen. Awesome. Yeah. So tell me a little bit more. Um, so you are a guitar maker in Taos, New Mexico. How did how did you get started? Uh, you know, making guitars. How did you end up doing this? Um, I mean, it's kind of a story in two parts. Uh, the originally, or way back when I was about nineteen, I was a guitar tech in L.A. for a place called Brower Studio Rentals that rented out guitars and amps to studios. And this was back in the early 90s when, you know, studios were really a big, a much bigger thing then. And this was like a a museum of guitars. It had an incredible collection of old Strats, old Les Pauls. Um, uh-huh. And then, you know, the old Tweed Fenders, Marshall Heads. Um, it, was, it was just amazing. And people would rent out these amps for recording and there was like, Basically, anybody you could think of recording in L.A. was borrowing or renting gear from there. Uh-huh. And uh, my job, I got an internship or apprenticeship first and then started working there full time. But my job basically ended up being just taking, making sure the guitars were ready to go out and making sure they were all okay when they came back in. That's pretty, probably a good way to learn, right? Because when people rent that kind of equipment, things are bound to happen. Yeah, and it, you know, I mean, this is like, like, you know, Prince rent, would rent guitars or Bonnie Raitt or John Fogarty. So it wasn't like people hacking away at it. These were like, you know, epic players. So it wasn't like they were getting like, like annihilated or, or anything. Like things were, they'd come back 
like messed up. It was just like, are they intonated? Or, you know, do I change the strings? But what it did was, or what I credit that to, that experience to, was that I got to hold all these guitars a lot. Yeah. That I wouldn't ordinarily ever get to hold. So I got to, you know, spend a lot of time with these old late 50s gold tops or, you know, and really kind of get a, a sense of, what do I like and why, why do, yeah. why does this, so, why does this one feel better to me than that one? So I, 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 I suspect that some folks will know what a 50, late fifties gold top is. And I'm certainly a fan of those, but for our uninitiated audience, what is a late fifties gold top and why, why is it special? Oh, uh, geez. I think it's like kind of the, the perfect combination of just what, what woods they were getting at the same at that time? How they were carving the neck? Right, um, it's, it's a Gibson electric guitar, right? So it's a like, yeah, and it's yeah. got it's got the the kind of like growl. Um, well, hold on, late fifty, early fifties when they had P nineties. It's like late fifties at humbuckers. I don't want to get too nerdy about guitars here, but you know, it's funny. I there's a lot of things I wish I could remember, and I can't remember. <laughs> cool. Like I can't remember specific dates of which Les Pauls they had, but yeah. I mean, I can tell you that. I mean, and here's the other thing is like, I rarely plugged them in. I was, I was sitting just playing them acoustic. So I had wow. that opportunity too, of just saying of like playing, which is how I've all like, when I was in the market to buy an SG, I went and played 20 SGs and I never plugged them in. <laughs> wow. You just wanted to hear I how they sounded acoustically. Yeah. Because I figured you can always put in good pickups, but you can't, if it's not like, if it's not projecting a, a tone as clear or cleanly as the next one, then, you know, you can't fix that stuff. Yeah. That's a really um, interesting point. So that was kind of the early beginnings of me on looking at, or, you know, spending time with guitars. And then as I'm, but I left that job after three years and moved to the beach cause I got burned out mm -hmm. <laughs> on, on the Hollywood recording world yep and uh and then that that world i bet will uh chew, chew you up good and spit you out fast yeah i wasn't yeah I, anyway i just needed to do something else and i was 20 21 so it or you know still figuring out what i was up to and what i wanted to do was play music and so that's what i did for like the next 20 years and while doing that i started learning learning carpentry trade because that, you know, helped me make money while I was trying to make music. Wow, okay. And then as I, you know, you just start, if you keep doing it, I just kept, you know, refining my skills to the point where by the time I moved here in Taos in 2010, where I had left music and stopped, like, left left trying to do that as a thing i moved here and was a uh, furniture worked for a guy who designed furniture and i was building his pieces and ca his furniture pieces and cabinet pieces and so but you weren't um, so you, when you talk about carpentry trade you were not i mean you were building things out of wood but they were not musical instruments right no yeah it was all like i was i did everything from foundation to the finish of a house is kind of how i how i call it it was all Wow. So what's Carpenter. what's fascinating about that is that now you're a successful, uh, you know, guitar maker. We'll talk about it. We'll, you know, we'll get to it in a, in a second here. But but really, um, it reminds me a little bit. Uh, Steve Jobs has a great uh, graduation speech uh, at Stanford University. I want to I want to say it's 2005, but I may be I may be butchering that. But uh, in any in any case, some sometime, uh, you know, about 10 years, 10 or so, 10, 15 years ago. And um, he talked about you cannot connect the dots of your life looking forward. You can only connect them looking backwards. You know, he kind of says that yeah. you know, different things in your life end up leading you to where you are. So it seemed like 20 years of playing music and becoming good at the carpentry trade. And now you're a guitar maker. That's, uh, that's poetic, right? That's how I look at it completely. It's all these, you know, and I also did little things. Like I was a jewel. I made jewelry. I, you know, I did all these little things things in my past seem to like all connect and make perfect sense once i started building my first acoustic which was when uh, i started in um i have to think about this 
I, I finished it. I started it in like January of 2012 and finished it that fall. Uh huh. Um, and what what was that? Was so, that a was that one of your appeal ones or was that something different? No, that was a dreadnought. Okay, that was so that one was of the early. large kind of country guitars or folk guitars. Right, and uh, I had a book, and I mean, what what started it all was a conversation with an old band mate of mine. He was getting a guitar made for him, um, and I thought, wow, that's a cool idea. Yeah, <laughs> and that re sparked this thing of like I. I, you know, I've always wanted to do that, and I work in this. This I was working out of a shop that my my boss had, and he had all the tools that I could do it in. And he would leave for Santa Fe every, like in the middle of the week for a night, and then the weekends to go see his girlfriend. Yeah. So he he'd be gone for you know, and I just he, I could stay in the shop, and so I'd make I'd stay late after work and start you know, work on building this guitar, trying yeah. to figure it out. So what was and it I, like? I mean, so for, for somebody who hasn't, I, I've only built electric ones. I have a, an acoustic kit right now that's sitting in my shop and that I haven't yet tackled. Uh-huh. Uh, what's it, what, I mean, what is it like to build your first, I mean, if you had woodworking skills, I guess that, that helps quite a bit, but um, I mean, was that, was that a daunting thing? Did you make a lot of mistakes? Uh, did it come out pretty good? What, what was your experience? Yeah, I made a lot of mistakes. Um, but nothing too. Wor- I mean, I still have it. Oh wow! And and I was really and it, it. I mean, the mistakes were more like. Let's see. It's just more in like it was hard to figure out all these things from reading books and watching videos. Like I spent. It took me a month to figure out how to attach the neck. Yeah. For sure. <laughs> you know, just thinking, is that how you do it? And and uh, so, and I kind of, I guess I went about it methodically because there wasn't like a, I had to ditch the fretboard or I had to do, you know, I didn't have to like throw away anything. I was, I was, I ended up with a guitar I was happy with. Awesome. And I actually finished it. And then like two weeks later, David Lindley came to play and I got to, like, for some reason I thought I'll show it to him. Okay. <laughs> And he hung out with me for like half an hour and talked about it. It was awesome. That is awesome. That is awesome. And that was your first experience connecting with somebody else through something, you know, an instrument that you made. Yeah. Yeah, it was. And uh, mm. I guess we'll we'll get to a pretty meaningful uh, thing that's happened just in the last week or so, week and a half, with uh, with you connecting with somebody else that's a major artist today through one of your uh, through one of your bills. But before we, yeah. we get to that, I'd love to. Um, you know, so how did you turn this? How did you go from making one guitar in your spare time to making this? Uh, you may, is this your main source of income right now? Or are you still yeah, had, no, it's been my main thing for uh, almost two years now. Wow. So how 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 was that transition? So that's something that we talk a lot about on the show, and a lot of people, past guests and and listeners, uh, talk about that that transition. How do you go from having something that you do that you love to do on the side to making that your main thing? Well, I did it on my free time. It's all I did. And it took me another, I, I, as soon as I finished one, I made, I started another. And that took me another like eight months to finish. And, and I was just kind of hooked. I just kept on making them. But that actually the um, really powerful thing you just said is in your free time, that is all you did. Meaning like you were not watching TV uh, you know, you were passing right. and going out, you know, drinking with your friends and whatever, and you were just built like whenever you were not quote unquote working, making the you know your regular paycheck, you were building a guitar. That's exactly true. I mean, I and I spent every evening watching YouTube's or reading forums or, you know, I I just kind of immersed myself in it. That's amazing. Um, because I didn't. There isn't. Every now and then, I hear of somebody around here who makes a guitar but there wasn't like i couldn't like go to so-and-so's shop and hang out and get the information or ask the specific questions that i had at the time so i had to seek it out um and so that's what i did and i mean if you're asking how i made the transition i just kept on making them and at some point somebody you know i somebody ordered one and i'm still working part-time or make full-time but i'm making it 
on the side for somebody. And then uh, we had a couple jobs fall through. Like we had a big kitchen job that was going to come come up. That would have been had me set for a few months, and that fell through. And all of a sudden, I had no work, but I had four guitars that were half finished. Oh. So I just I just finished those <laughs> and found some people. You know, some people bought them, and you know, and then work would pick up again. And I and I that's kind of how I how I was doing it as I like work started falling like a few jobs would fall fall out and but i'd have this guitar thing that i could fall back on now your guitars are amazing uh and uh they um you know they have a very unique uh they're, they're beautiful they sound, they sound great but at the same time it must have been a challenge how were you selling these guitars like in because taos new mexico is how many people live there i want to say it's what twenty thirty thousand. it's hard to say because it's like that what they would call the county which is big oh okay so it's even smaller than that yeah so I mean, it's not it's, a huge market for guitars i've only i've just finished um number 76 and i've only sold uh to two people here in taos yeah so that makes sense so how were you so you said you sold those four how did you find those customers how did you who did you sell them to luckily they were old friends <laughs> okay okay you know Two went to friends I had in high school. One was a engine, a recording engineer, a friend of mine in Colorado. Um, I'm trying to think. Oh, another one was an old friend from California. You know, so my friends helped. You know, they showed interest, and they, you know, they helped me out early on. Okay, so your first customers were your friends, and then yeah, they built up from there. Yeah, and you know, kind of rent like that's in a way maybe the beauty of facebook of like you know this one friend i have i hadn't talked to since high school but you know you've connected on facebook and he's like oh i'll buy that so mm -hmm. <laughs> wow okay that's awesome so basically yeah so i'm just i'm just trying to like piece this all together so you you have all you have your your passion for for music you played for 20 years we before we started rolling tape you talked about um uh, how you uh were into you know, kind of more electronic music, right? Right. And then you start Carpentry as a trade, and then you m merge those two things, start doing, building guitars in all the spare time that you have from your day job. And then the first few people who buy them are your friends. How do you go from that to then being a builder who is selling to people who don't know you? Um. How do you, let's see. I'm trying to think of the progression of it. Um, the first ten were probably in my not immediate, like just in like some, even if it was a friend of a friend. So it was kind of that circle. Uh -huh. um, and my actually my my ninth guitar that it made was the first PL one which is the L1 replica. Right, and L1 is like um, an old, old um, 1930s Gibson guitar, right? Or earlier than that, yeah. Actually, that's right, I mean, that's right. They started a little bit earlier than that. Um, and I, <clears throat> I, at that time when I decided to make that, I was trying to figure out, well, how do you make this leap to becoming a guitar? Like, how do you do this full time? Yep. Because I definitely wanted to, but you can look on the internet um, and see who's building a, you know custom acoustic guitars and you just your head will explode the people are doing the most amazing work out there and so how do you get how do you find your own your an avenue which people would that you're interested in doing and that people are interested in buying and so how do you differentiate and, by making something by like not only differentiate but differentiate making something that that people you know want to buy that give they, they give a damn about yeah, and nobody was making that, at least that I could figure out, that L1, and I was kind of obsessed with it. And I thought, if I really like this, maybe there are other people that do too. Yeah. And um, so I made one, and I, as a prototype, I still have that. Um, and I loved it. And so I immediately made six more. Wow. 
Did um, you make that mold from scratch, or were you using like a PL mold and then adapting it? What were you doing? No, I've I made it all from scratch. Wow. Um, <clears throat> and the the first one I gave to my friend Sean Hayes, who's a a great singer songwriter in the Bay Area. One yeah, of my favorites. So he, I you suggested a few weeks ago that uh, right. I'd go see him here in Austin, and I did. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And uh, and I said, you know, will you will you record some, <laughs> record some songs with this so I can post them on the you know on YouTube? Yeah. And so and then I put the rest of them on uh, the others on Reverb and sold them that way. Wow. And that was the be- that was the beginning of selling to people I hadn't met before. Okay. And Reverb uh, for our audience who may not know is kind of like a very uh, instrument specific version of eBay, right? Right, you can, yeah. Um, I, and it's a much more incredible sort resource than eBay um, is for for a player. There's so many, yeah. I mean, it, but basically, yeah, it's a store for online store for gear. Yeah, yeah. They they have an interesting story. I think I think they were started out of Chicago Music Exchange, if I remember correctly. Um, that would make sense. But yeah, I you know what I'm 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 not going to continue down that line because I don't I'm not sure that's true. But I <laughs> for some reason that, that that's popping into my mind. Yeah. Um. Very cool. So now and now you are at the point where how, how many you've made seventy six guitars, right? Yes. That is amazing. How many on average are you putting out a year now? Uh, it's changing. Um. I think I did. Shoot, I should have written these numbers down before, <laughs> before nah, we no, talked. No, no, it's all good. It doesn't, have, it doesn't have to be perfect. It's just direction. I think I made about 25 last year. Wow. <clears throat> wow, so uh, two, two a month. That's quite, that's quite a few. Yeah, and that last year I was still making sticks. Uh, this time last year I made my first electric. Okay, you, oh, you were making most um, acoustics and now you go and, into electrics. I was making all acoustics uh, okay. this time last year. Except for my first uh, electric okay. guitar, I love the I love the Taos birds in the back. By the way, they're uh, they're singing <laughs> yeah. as a song. <laughs> yeah, awesome. Um, um, so then, and and still just you, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Cool. So maybe we can talk now a little bit about. Uh, so you you had made a bunch of. Uh, they're they're kind of like a yeah like a modified it's not it's not a replica it's like a it's like a inspired by the you know Gibson L one, but then uh, you started making these electric guitars that are I mean I don't know you want to talk a little bit about uh, your latest electric guitars and then how um, how that came about. I could, but I thought you might be interested in this too. Okay, I was still I was still working full time when I made those six PL ones. Okay, and um. And then I was out, of, and then work fell out again. And then I was out of work, and uh, I was—I'm trying to think of how, like, this—the timeline of this. But like, you know, I was out of work for a while and trying to make. Uh, so I was thinking, oh, I just keep making these guitars and making these guitars, and um, and then I had—I was looking for work and finally found one where I was going to build a house for, which would have kept me busy for months and i was pretty psyched (laughs) and i went to help my old boss do something that i had and i was going to start that job on on um monday Mm -hmm. and that would have meant it was construction it would have meant i would have had no time to build guitars because once you get into like construction work you're you're pooped you can't it's hard to have energy at the end of the day to work on finesse stuff like guitars um and so the the wednesday before i went to go um um help my old boss do something that i've done for i mean i've done this uh, i don't know h- hundreds or thousands of times on a router table and uh and i ended up cutting off part of my finger oh no <laughs> and so it meant i couldn't i couldn't um start the job on monday that would have kept me busy for the next eight months or something or whatever oh, no. it would have been so I was out of work, and then yet again, like I have to make this guitar thing a thing, and that's really 
I credit that to being like actually the birth of it becoming a full time. Jesus, that's like the full time job. The gruesome version of Bob Ross's Happy Little Accidents. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God! So how how much do you think did you lose? About a quarter of an inch. Okay, that's a pretty well. I mean, once it heals up, that's probably fine. But it's still losing that much. It's, it's uh, must have been painful. It was on my left hand, and it freaked me out. I mean, my immediate thought was, oh, I can never make a guitar again. What's the you know? If you can't play it, you can't you can't make them. Or can you, you still play it or not? Yeah. Okay. It took me a while to. There was some things that took a while to get back, but now. You know, it's all, it's, it's numb, but I, it's like, you know, it doesn't keep me from playing at all. It's, Man, so it's just, that, that was just, brutal. I think that was the, but it was just kind of the lesson I took from it is that, you know, these good things still happen out of awful things. Yeah. Cause it, it, it focused what I was doing and it took me and it, took me to where I am at I'm at now and so I, I definitely credit that as kind of being a major pivot point that's for what for wide sky that's incredible and then you so how huh how long did it take you to heal up well enough to be able to make a guitar or were you just able to work and you just bandage it up and work I had one on my bench that like I literally had to just put strings on and set up before I could send it off to sell or it was sold and I just was like I you know, if I, that, so I, like I needed money. <laughs> and so there was that thing that just like, it, it kind of like got me back in the, in the shop because it was almost done. And then I just didn't stop. Yeah. Just kept Nothing going. focuses you like a lack of cash, right? Yeah. That is a motivator for sure. Yeah. Holy wow. That's intense. Well, now that, yeah, that's, uh, given that, that, I mean, I'm, I'm I guess I'm, thankful that that happened but that's a that's a weird weird thing to say <laughs> yeah i mean it's just i think I, man you could look at a bunch of different things like that like the i had two pl1s that were I, a friend of mine is a sound engineer for, or does the front of house for the lumineers uh -huh. and they were starting their tour and and he's and i asked him would they be interested in this guitar he's like I think that's exactly what we're looking for for this tour. Wow. And uh, so I sent the two out to him, and there was about a week where I thought they were going to take it. And then he's like, nah, he doesn't it, He doesn't want to switch guitars that much. So they sent him back, and I thought, oh, uh, bummer. bummer. <laughs> yeah. And then I put I put them on for sale on Reverb, and then Reverb like somehow caught their eye, and they featured it in their newsletter. And then that, like took the whole thing to another level wow. so it was like this it was yet again like this uh, this bummer that turned into a really good thing wow and and honestly i feel like so much of my success has been that <laughs> in yeah. some sort some sort of way like you know that well, was you've a drag. Kept, i mean oh. but here's the thing you've kept pushing forward right so i think i think you have uh decoupled uh temporary setbacks from permanent defeat and i think that's a really important thing i mean i'd say that's it's that perseverance of like you know okay you know you 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 get knocked down you get up and you try again and uh, you know where i learned that from was from being in a band okay um because i had there was a we had a a deal with warner brothers a warner brothers subsidiary and we recorded a whole album um literally the day we finished it uh, we got word that our A&R guy was fired and somebody else came on and now we were, our, we didn't, we couldn't even get our album that we had finished. No, oh, the, the studio, the studio owned it for like a year and a half. So it was, <laughs> so it was things like that could constantly being in a band thinking we're going on tour in Japan. Oh no, we're not. So you, I had this like my, I guess I'd been trained like that's, you, you can't just stop you have to keep going yeah just because like that awesome thing didn't happen then you will so let's let's talk just... about that for a minute because this is something that so it's come up in a few different episodes uh i did an episode with my friend nick betcher 
who's actually you should meet him. He's a spectacular musician here, and and uh, you should listen to his episode because he sings a beautiful original song at the end of it at the end of the episode of the podcast. But awesome. we talk a little bit about that, and he's um, one of the managers here at Austin Vintage Guitars in, in town, and yeah, he's a good, very good friend of mine. And we what that's one of the things we talked about is like you know handling uh setbacks and the psychology of like and how do you uh you know keep going and get out of your own way in, in, in a lot of ways can you tell me a little bit more about that because it seems like you have an awareness about about this part of you that has helped uh helped your success and your, your continued growth which is like so what just just because you get up and recover it doesn't mean that you don't feel the emotional pain or the pang of, or, or, or like the burn of, of the negative event, right? You still feel that you just, Oh yeah. How, how do you handle that? Like what happens in your head and your head and how do you process that? I mean, I guess the, the thing is, it's just, you can't live in it or else, I mean, you have still have to move forward. So what's the next step? And that's, that was, you know, that didn't work out this past thing, but so what's the next step? You still have to keep moving, moving forward. If you live in like what was a, just in the, just the bummer just then. So what, but um, walk, walk me through your actual like thought process and like, how do you coach yourself to, to come out of that? So let's say, let's say something bad happened. So, you know, boom, you lost a part of your finger or boom, you, you know, no, no longer have a record or boom, you're, uh, you know, the Lumineers return the guitar. So that sucks when you hear that, when you get that. So how, how do you, what is the mental process through which you go to get yourself back on track and make sure that, uh, you know, it's, uh, what, what's the Buddha saying that pain is mandatory, but suffering is optional. So how do you decouple those <laughs> things? I wish I had a good way to explain it other than just, you know, recognize that it was a bummer, but you just, well, now what? Yeah. I'm, I'm not, I'm not really sure I have a, like a, a method. It's just because each time is different. Okay. There's one, one thing hurts more than the other, first, <laughs> you know, right. but, uh, I, yeah, I just think it's just put your head down and do your work. That's part of a, a an artist friend of mine who has done amazingly well. Um, that was one of, one of his pieces of just something he said at one point was just like his thing was just to put his head down, you know, just put your head down, focus on what you do. And at some point it's kind of things will, will catch up or it'll, I mean, it's good. Just, it's going to work out. And yeah. just, if you're doing the work that you feel really good about. Yeah. I've seen that a lot with my music actually too, because, uh, um, you know, as, as a relatively new artist, somebody who was writing their own music, um, you know, there were definitely some some major setbacks with some venues where where I used to play, where I know I, then I know was, was no longer playing, and then you keep doing your thing, and now I'm all of a sudden playing a few you know blues festivals and things like that, and and yeah, yeah it just it's always like this ebb and flow of uh, and and yeah, what's helped me too is just say like okay, just uh, you know keep keep going. <laughs> yeah, I I mean I don't know how else to explain it. Just. Yeah. And, and it probably okay. So here's something that's valuable. It's uh, it probably gets easier over time, right? As long like the 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 recovery time, if you will, that you have today for a negative event like that is probably shorter than it was when you first heard that your album wasn't going to be out, right? Yeah, because that. I mean, honestly, being in the band has like brought me to to that completely because so like. I mean, if you've, you you know how it is, or if you've tried, if you tried to push your life and or push music as your your life, it's it's not easy. Yeah. And there's just countless. I mean, it actually happened the second time too with our album. We were in in the studio and we, you know, the record label fell through. Like it's it happened. So it's happened twice to me. Um. Mm -hmm. So it's just like, I I guess I'm just. I don't have this, maybe it's how I set things up. Like I don't get super, super excited about something that might happen. It's just, I think this can happen. That'd be great. And, but it's, I haven't set myself up like, Oh, I really, you know, I, I really hope this is, this is, this is the chance or that like this opportunity comes through. Like I don't get super like, um, 
focused on like that has to happen or else it's going to be a drag. Right. So it's, it's basically like a balance of uh, constant optimism without putting too much of a stake in the outcome of one particular event. Maybe, I don't, you might throw pessimism in there too. Um, <laughs> Cause I definitely like, I don't know. I'll believe it when I see it too kind of thing. Yeah. But at the uh. same time you have the optimism that you, it, 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 underneath what you're saying is that you trust the process, right? You continue to, maybe it's yeah. not, maybe it's not that one particular thing. So you're not, you're not putting, you are putting a stake in the long run outcome of things. That's why you do this. But yeah. you're not putting all of the weight of the world on one event. Right, exactly. Definitely a long game. Like it's, this may work, this may not. But, you know, you just keep putting those pieces that you feel are good pieces or like to use or like trying to, trying to create these different opportunities. Um, and some work, some don't, but just keep creating opportunities and that. And I think that's something I've learned, especially from being in a band, just, you know, use, con you have connections, use them, um, try and open as many doors as you can shake up or kick up as much dust. And it doesn't all go somewhere. Yeah. A lot of times it doesn't, but a lot of times it does. So it's, you know, you just have to, it doesn't, but it, what doesn't happen or nothing happens if you don't like really like just kick up a lot of dust you know yeah. it's like and things connect in weird ways too so i mean i i interviewed oh, yeah. this woman robin uh for the podcast uh god it's gonna be it's gonna be coming up on two years now uh, two years ago and then now she followed me on instagram and then she invited me to play for a, a blues festival in mississippi yeah uh, so like things like that end up uh you know it's it is the long game but uh, was, let's I we we talked about the struggles a little bit. I want to talk a little bit about your wins because you've had some really really meaningful ones. So the Lumineers yeah. returned their guitar, but some of the folks haven't returned theirs. So can you tell tell me a little bit more about some of the? Uh, there's some really big names, uh, and then culminating on like what happened this last week. Uh, yeah, and, and what what that's meant for you. Um, a really interesting one was um. I'm trying to think of when it would have been. Uh, it would have been a little over a year ago. I put a I put a photo up of a um, of a PL1 that was for sale, and somehow John Doe, um, the bass player from the band X, saw it. Somehow it came up in his feed, and he started writing me, and he and he and he bought it. Uh -huh. And um, and I'm a little embarrassed because I didn't know who I was emailing back and forth with for a little bit okay <laughs> and uh and and then i realized like oh wow john doe of x that's crazy um but he's played the thing it, he he has a, a acoustic folk trio that he does and he's he's he wanted that guitar for that trio and he played it he's played it a lot and it's been all over the place awesome um including he was playing a show in Oakland and he's friends with uh, Billy Joe Armstrong. And, um, and I got a text the next day or something saying, you know, Billy's going to buy one of these guitars. Cause and, he, for, and who is uh, Billy Joe for our audience who may not know who that is? Uh, he's the guitarist, singer, um, front man of uh, Green Day. Yeah. And I think most people would know who that is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and it turned out, and so a couple of weeks later, I got an email actually from his wife, and she wanted to buy him an electric guitar for his birthday. Okay. And so it's like a very, sometimes, so that's one of these instances where I didn't, I wasn't actually trying to put any pieces anywhere. It just happened, like just completely out of what I, you know, out of the internet searches. And like it came from the search that John Doe did to, you know, the, I had nothing to do with that path. Yeah. Another, um, I had just, uh, early last fall, I had just finished a, an electric guitar I called Rec I call Reckoner, which is um, kind of a jazz master, a Fender jazz master-ish guitar, which is like an offset, not symmetrical guitar. It's a kind of, it's got like its own unique cult following that type of guitar. Right. And and I've been really intrigued by those for forever. And I made one and I called it Reckoner after um 
which is the name of my favorite Radiohead song, and I, it just for some reason seemed to fit. Um, and then two weeks later, Tom York, the um, God, the lead lead singer, I'm not sure how you, you know, front I can't call him the front man of Radiohead, announced the solo tour, and I thought, oh wow, I can, I need to try and get one of these to him. Uh-huh. And uh, I have, you know, from playing music, I have friends who know people. So I, you know, I asked, uh, I have a friend who talks to his management every now and then, and and he asked if Tom would be interested in the guitar, and he said, yeah. So I sent it to him, and it was one of these things where, you know, I don't know if he'll like it or what'll happen. It just seemed like he's, Radiohead is one of the, is one of the bands I probably listen to, or is the band I listen to the most. Like uh-huh. I've been obsessed with them for a long time. So it just was one of those personal things of like, I really want to get a guitar to one of my favorite artists. Yeah. It just, and here's, I'm going to see what happens. And I wasn't expecting anything, but then you know, he got it two days before his tour ended in December. Um, and then I got a little note from his management saying he loves it. Check out or keep your eyes open. He might play it. And I thought that would be crazy. And then he did on the last show, he played the song Reckoner on his Reckoner. Wow. As an encore. (laughs) What did that feel like? It was honestly, it was totally surreal. Like I, it took me, I don't think I slept for a couple of days. Like I couldn't really fathom the whole thing because there was a lot of things at play there. It was like, it felt like this, all this work I had put into trying to get to where I am. Like some, it, well, for instance, it's, it's one thing to just have a guitar and sit there on the couch and play it and think, yeah, this is, I like it. It's a whole other thing to take it on stage and to count on it. Mm-hmm. And to actually like put it to stand in front of people a, a sold out uh, theater and use that instrument, it's it's a different level of trust with the guitar. So to have that yep. trust, that was a that was a definitely a turning point of thinking, wow, okay, this is this guy can play anything, and he didn't have to do that. There wasn't like a like I should play this guitar because I would be, you know because he gave it to me he didn't that wasn't something he had to do he just did so it was i don't know it was a big it was that was amazing did he know that the guitar was called the reckoner oh yeah 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 he knew that i mean that's he hadn't he wasn't playing that song in his set (laughs) wow that's wild so yeah and something even bigger or well of, of this of a similar magnitude just happened to you last week what is it right. that happened last week that is uh it's been changing your life and it's been uh, it's been pretty amazing it's been well last saturday uh gary clark jr played in albuquerque and i've never gotten to hear him play live before um but i've been listening to him for a long time and really like a lot and this time last year i mean it's almost literally exactly a year ago when my first when i put the strings on the electric guitar for the first time the the one i just my first electric uh uh, i was listening to him nonstop, and it was like like i couldn't stop listening to his music and it was like i felt like this thing you know he's gary's dna is in this thing because it's like all i listened to while i was designing it while i was building the jigs while i was building the tooling to make that specific guitar yeah. and then to the finish of it and then i got it and then i'm trying to do my gary clark jr wish i could riff like him kind of thing and stuff mm-hmm. when i first have it um so when he when his show got announced i thought i've got to try and get one to him mm-hmm. <laughs> like and uh it's so last saturday uh, when he played Albuquerque, he they did um, four no five shows, that, or that was the first of five, um, a little run until now they're off until June. But um, I, I, so I, a old drummer friend of mine who lives in Austin, 
knows his drummer and put me in touch. And then so I got in touch with him and met him back st- or met him uh, after the show and gave him the guitar and you know basically told him the story of like what I just said, like how you know I've been listening to you a lot while making this and it seems like you should have one. <laughs> so wow, what was his reaction? He was pretty. I mean. He was pretty into it. Like, it was, it was really fun to watch him open the case and see his face, and then see him pick the thing up and hold it. And we, you know, and then play the thing. Like he was just, he wasn't plugging it in. We were in the green room, and he's just playing away and talking about it. And it was, I think, mean, it was amazing. If yeah. that had been, if that had been it, that would have been perfect. You know, but that, that was been, not just it. No, it wasn't. And that's the crazy thing. So like, he's like, he said, I can't wait to plug this thing in and a uh, sound check. And so the next sound check he did, and then he ended up playing it for three quarters of his set for the next four shows. Wow. That is unbelievable. It, you, you were telling me, you were sending me a message the other day that your favorite pastime is now searching the hashtag on Instagram, right? Because you can see your <laughs> guitar on stage. Yeah. That's like, Yeah finding little video clips of him because you know people phones are everywhere now at concerts and so it's really been fascinating to see all these different clips of him playing the guitar at different venues or different songs different venues it's like it's pretty mind-blowing so what has this meant for your business have you seen an influx of interest in your in your uh, builds yeah it's been bonkers i hadn't even thought of it that way too when uh, it was more like it wasn't even in my like thought process of like oh this will be good for the business it was just like he should have one of these because he's all i've been listening to right um but it's been like i step back from it and think and think about it and i can't honestly think that there's been a better guitar player out there right now to get one to yeah and then when when i think about it like that i think man (laughs) how funny how that all worked out because that wasn't yeah i hadn't even occurred to me before that so do, are you backed oh. up in orders now? I mean, are people reaching out and they want to buy one of these things? How, how's, that, how's that? Yeah, I've, I've, I mean, I think I had 6,000 visits to my Instagram that week. Wow. Um, I've, yeah, it's like I've gotten a lot of emails. A lot have come through. Um, it solidified a dealership in Tokyo. Um so it's it's been really i mean it's been way bigger than i i mean i hadn't like i said hadn't thought about it. it's been it's been really it was a good break oh, so what does this mean for your business i mean what does this mean are you gonna have to hire more people to help you make these because uh you know that uh <laughs> i don't know i'm kind of overwhelmed for you right now no i don't have intentions of hiring anyone okay um it's that doesn't interest me. I'd, what I'd like to do, and I don't have intentions of raising the price or whatever. It's like I've. What I do like the idea is having something I can count on, like a backlog. Yeah. That appeals to me. Of course. Um. But, I mean, I've I've run I've had run carpentry crews before. It's or just. The idea of keeping people busy is, it's not something I'm, I'm particularly looking, like something I want to do at all. Okay. Um, and I might change my mind at some point, but certainly that's not, that's not even my five-year plan. It's just like, that's just, that's not interesting to me. I'd like, okay. I like the idea of like making my, having a, a nice schedule ahead of me, doing my work and, and getting better at it. That's awesome. And how long is your wait list right now? Uh, I'm just kind of in, well, I'm including the builds I'm going to do for NAM, so February. Wow. You're, you're all the way up to February. So it is now, Jesus, we're mm-hmm. in the, at the end of May, right? Yeah. So if, if, if I were to put in an order today, I wouldn't have a good turn until March of next year. Yeah. Wow. Probably. That is amazing. Congratulations. Thanks. And uh, yeah, hopefully at least one of our listeners will uh, will go check out your stuff and uh, and, and get one. I, I'm certainly <laughs> interested in getting one at some point in the near future. So, 
Um, well, here's something, you know, here's something I do too, is I don't, I don't stuff my schedule. Like I'm not, I think I can build four electric or I can build four electrics in a month, but I don't plan for that. Okay. And that's something that for whatever reason I thought of early on. And I think that's served me pretty well is to not over schedule or like, so that I'm not like spazzing out like to get <laughs> to get orders filled yeah and also you move to a place i mean taos is beautiful it's uh it's got a little bit of a slower pace and uh i mean it's still a, i guess it's a ski town so there's some some stuff that's more expensive but relative to like certainly like larger urban areas at lower cost of living so you can uh plan your life and and uh and make your nut and and be happy yeah figure out the next vacation that's awesome <laughs> That's awesome. Um, what is there anything else that you want our audience to know about you or your business? Where can people find you? If people are interested to know more about White Sky Guitars, uh, where, where where can people go? Uh, well, they can go to my website, which is uh, widesky.com, or Instagram's really good. Okay, um, it's White Sky W I D E S K Y dot com. Oh, guitars, sorry. Guitars. White Sky. Yeah. Okay. I should so, know my own website. <laughs> W-I-D-E-S-K-Y <laughs> guitars.com. And that's where people can find you. And if they're interested right. in learning more or putting an order <clears throat> for one of your beautiful instruments, they can do it there. Yeah. Now, you mentioned that you're going to be focusing more on building electrics and the, the acoustics, you're facing them out. Is that still the case? Or how, how are you thinking about that? I have one more. Actually, I just got a peel one order. Um, because of last week with Gary, but I, you know, they take a lot more time. Honestly, it kind of comes down to, I can, I can make, I can sort of make a living making acoustic guitars, but I can, I can make a living making electric guitars. There you go. So there's, That's an important there's consideration. Yeah. And there's a lot more headaches with acoustics. There's so many more variables involved with bending wood and thin tops and backs, and um, but it's interesting. When I started, I thought, "Well, I'm not. I don't see any re reason to build electrics. I'm going to build acoustics." And now I'm on the other end of that. <laughs> oh, that sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> well, Patch, it's been really inspiring and amazing to listen to your experiences, and I've certainly learned a lot um, from from your outlook on life. So I thank you for being a guest on Small Business War Stories, and uh, I look forward to staying in touch. Me too. I really appreciate it. Sounds good, man. Have a good one. You too. Bye. Take care. Small Business War Stories. Small businesses are the soul of America. And this is where they tell their stories. I am your host, Pablo Fuentes. <laughs>